want to welcome our panelists uh, to uh, the panel discussion portion of our agenda today. Um, I think that the, the topic about why and how industry uh, and academia collaborating, particularly the why, seems an abstract, a pretty uh, easy thing to answer. Um, companies, especially small, uh, innovative biotechnology companies, really need new technology. Uh, and academia is often the place to go for that because of the focus on basic research. And academic investigators often wish to see uh, their research advance to products. And then, of course, of course, both they and the university have a potential uh, interest uh, in revenue from the technology. Uh, but, um, and the value of the relationship is, is really quite clear by a lot of measures, certainly when we look at, at the monetary value. The, the biotechnology industry organization, organization has estimated the value uh, or the economic impact of such collaborations uh, at almost $200 billion uh, over the last 10 years. But of course, if you ask practitioners, you ask folks from industry or folks from academia on either sides of the fence, and they'll tell you that it really comes down to relationships. That's what people uh, often communicate. It's all about that synergy between two people uh, and really between the scientists um, and the groups of people on both sides, on the academic side and on the industry side. So here today we have three pairs uh, of uh, scientists from each side of that fence uh, here to talk about what makes their uh, collaboration uh, successful. So by way of introducing the panelists as well as um, getting to hear a little bit of background, I think we'll, we'll go down uh, starting from here, uh, starting with Dan and Tom uh, to talk about their collaboration and then move on to the next team. So why don't you talk a little bit about the, the substance of your collaboration and what the, the nature of that technology uh, that you've worked on or are working on is. Yeah, so uh, I work on Listeria monocytogenes, and some years ago considered it as a, as a vector for uh, infectious diseases. And then about 12 or 13 years ago, a local company on the, independently started um, using Listeria, not for infectious diseases initially, but for, as a vector for cancer immunotherapy, and contacted me uh, to consult because I, as, as a microbiologist. And Tom, who is, is now the CSO of Adura Biotech in Berkeley. And so over the years, we interacted really on the, initially um, as, just a collab as collaborators, really trying to identify what the best bacterial vectors were um, in, in mouse models of infection. And meanwhile, my lab continued to do just very basic research. Sometimes it impacted on what they were doing. And other times, we, it, it did not. But, other, but what was also interesting is that there were things that were going on in Aduro that impacted the research in our lab as well. And maybe we'll get into some of those examples. But over the years, as the company evolved, um, the relationship evolved in co-publications. There were times when we had patents that were, um, just, what's the word? <laughs> Invented uh, at Berkeley and, uh, and they would help license and support the patents. And then over the years, people from my lab, some who wanted to work in biotech would take jobs at the company. And so three of my ex-students now um, work at Aduro. So, so I think that's, uh, most of what I have to say, Tom? Sure. Great, thanks. So I'll uh, sort of continue um, you know, with uh, uh, what Dan had to say. And I mean, the reason that, that we initially had interest, of course, in, in working uh, with the Portnoy Lab was because we had a company that was uh, uh, interested in developing therapies, um, uh, immune based therapies for cancer. And, and uh, then and, and now, I think one of the principal correlates of uh, therapeutic efficacy, at least using the uh, immune system, are T cells. And, and uh, people that know the listeria field know that in the mouse listeriosis model, um, that T cell immunity is uh, the uh, principal correlate, of, the only correlate, actually, of, of protection. And so from really just a simple uh, perspective, of course, um, our interest initially around uh, listeria 
was based on, on that uh, uh, principal understanding of listeria pathogenesis. And then I think probably everyone in the room knows that, that uh, um, wild type listeria would never be the basis of a, you know, an effective uh, therapy and then potentially eventually as a basis for um, um, vaccines against an infectious disease. And so this is really where the collaboration was critical because uh, Dan's lab had spent um, um, a, 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 most of his uh, um, work in understanding the, uh, um, the molecular de bacterial determinants for pathogenesis, in particular um, ACT-A. And it was really sort of taking those early cues um, from uh, pathogenesis and understanding the bacterial determinants of those that was the basis actually of de developing a live attenuated strain, which uh, now is actually in uh, phase uh, two um, very large controlled clinical uh, trials in the setting of uh, pancreatic cancer. The other major component of, of developing uh, these uh, listeria uh, based vaccines, of course, is gene expression. And I think that is really kind of where the collaboration became uh, very back and forth. Um, two of the, the early uh, scientists in our group that came from Dan's lab, Justin Scoble and then Pete Lauer, and Pete in particular, developed all these uh, approaches for um, the efficient expression and secretion of antigens so that you get robust uh, class one expression. Um, or class one presentation and then T cell immunity. And it was a lot of those um, sort of expression algorithms in, in many of the genetic tools, which then have um, been very useful to the Portnoy lab in further understanding uh, pathogenesis and, and how the bacterium interacts with the host. And so at least for, I think at the beginning of any um, uh, collaboration between uh, biotech and academia, when it's largely scientific concepts, without that sort of interaction, it would just um, be a huge hole in the development, I think, of, of new therapies that potentially are useful. Thanks. Uh, Carol and Vu? Two? Oh, that's your interest. <laughs> My interest. So we, are, we, uh, we, we have a, a rich uh, history of collaboration with, uh, with Jerry's uh, lab. Uh, we were uh, very interested in respiratory infections, and uh, we were looking for uh, ways to uh, target the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a common gram-negative bacteria uh, that is associated with a lot of uh, respiratory infection, uh, hospital-acquired pneumonia, bron uh, um, COPD, uh, especially in the advanced stage of, of, of diseases, uh, infection associated with cystic fibrosis. And so we were looking for, um, for um, an approach uh, that um, uh, that is uh, going to be uh, used in the therapeutic fashion. And so antibodies uh, was what we're, uh, we, we thought of. And we, uh, uh, we knew that, um, that Dr. Pierce's lab um, has, a, uh, has a strong uh, leadership position in this area. He's been working on this area for a number of years, uh, uh, one of the world's expert in the bacterial immunology and, and, and how to create vaccines and potential therapeutic uh, uh, drugs uh, against it, and so we, we came upon his work associated with uh, antibodies against carbohydrate that are on the capsules of bacteria, and and um, uh, we've we've uh, licensed uh, the the antibody from, uh, from 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 Brigham, but we we just didn't want to simply license the antibody and move on our way and and uh, turn into greedy biotech companies and try to. Uh, commercialize uh, his uh, rich uh, history of, of, uh, of work. We wanted to uh, continue the collaboration because we, we felt that this, A, this was a complex area uh, that, that needs better understanding. He is clearly an expert in this area. And so as we begin to uh, continue his, uh, his work, which, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, just terrific, uh, we want to understand a little bit more about the, uh, the, how the antibody works, um, uh, the immunobiology of, uh, of the bacteria, and, and, and how this drug uh, could be used and developed. Um, and, and so uh, it began uh, a, a history where we decided to apply for um, NIH funding together, and, and we, we, we received the funding that allows us to continue to, to uh, replicate uh, the work from his lab, and then continue on to um, a later stage of NIH support, which, uh, which uh, took the project all the way from early uh, research uh, through, uh, through um, uh, late stage preclinical development, through um, um, uh, scale-up manufacturing process to clinical manufacture and, and IND. We actually just submitted the IND yesterday, as a matter of fact. 
And so the, the phase one study for, for his drug is, uh, is going to start in about a month to two months from now. And so uh, it, 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 we, we thought this is a, a very nice example of, of uh, uh, a, a great um, industry academic collaboration that, that, uh, that uh, we thought it'd be nice to, uh, to share some of the experience with you. Well, that's great. Um, fortunately, I've been doing this a long time since I graduated from this institution a long time ago, and I've had a lot of technology licensed and given back, so asking me to comment on the quality of relationships is a little bit like asking Elizabeth Taylor or Larry King to be your marriage counselor. I'm a little <laughs> cynical in that regard, um, but this one has worked out well, so, you know, on occasion, you know, it, it does work out and the technology does move forward. And I think the key is, and there was actually interestingly just an article in uh, Nature Review's drug discovery, either the December or November, I forget which, which sort of characterized or addressed this topic of how to get technology developed in an academic setting into commercial development, because it's not easy. It is really hard. Most of us in an academic NIH-funded situation don't pay much attention to what you need to do to really get a drug manufactured. We can't write a specific aim for it. Nobody's going to fund it. And it's not very interesting, to tell you the truth. You know, how do you scale up production is just a bunch of different variables. It's not a particularly hypothesis-driven approach. So that's always great to have a company that does do that, that knows how to do that, that can take your cell line and turn it from producing milligrams into grams and, you know, optimize it and things like that. So that's been one of the strengths of the relationship here. To have people who know what the critical questions are going to be. Again, you know, I think the strength of most academic labs is in discovery. And what we can provide are sometimes platform technologies, but more often lead candidates for drug development. That we sort of know what works best, as you saw in some of the talks this morning, optimizing what works best, whether it's an individual molecule or combinations, are things that academic investigators can understand. So we can provide that, I think, to for commercial development, and when you can get the relationship working where they take what you've got and basically treat it as a candidate drug ready for nomination to go forward and actually get it manufactured and get it into clinical trial, that's the most successful type of relationship. The ones that haven't worked generally are because you're working with a group or a company or an organization that has lots of products, lots of candidates, and yours just doesn't make it. And it may have nothing to do with major medical need. It may simply be that they can see a much greater rate of return on another statin drug as opposed to a vaccine for staph infection. So that's a major barrier that I've encountered in my work of having, how do you translate major medical need, which you know most pharmaceutical companies are very enthusiastic about, into competition against something that's much more likely to generate a profit. So balancing your academic development skills and, tech skills and abilities with the commercial side of development, I think, is the real challenge here. So Jay and Chris, you have a, kind of a, uh, a little bit of a different uh, biotechnology co collaboration. Why don't you tell us uh, an, an approach to that, an origin of that collaboration. Why don't you tell us about that? Um, so my laboratory works on engineering chemistry inside microbes. And in 2002, about that time, we started working on artemisinin. It's an anti-malarial drug. It's extremely effective. It's derived from a plant. And we were trying to take the genes out of the plant and put them into uh, bacteria and yeast and get them uh, to produce it. And uh, we had some interest from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to fund the work. And as we were thinking about uh, the scale up of that, not only just the science, but the scale up, um, we could pair with uh, a pharmaceutical company uh, to do the work. But many of them didn't have the expertise at that time to do metabolic engineering. Um, and we were also concerned that uh, many of these projects going into large companies, sometimes they don't get the attention that they need. It could fall by the wayside. So we decided rather than doing that, we would start a company. Um, and four postdocs from my laboratory and I started Amaris, 
um, and we applied to the Gates Foundation, got funding for this in uh, the end of 2004, um, and then did the basic science to engineer uh, an initial microbe um, yeast to produce a precursor to artemisinin called artemisinic acid that could then be easily chemically converted into artemisinin. And then uh, Amaris took over the project and uh, really made that an industrial uh, strength bug. Okay, so over to the industrial side. Thanks, Jay. So uh, by way of scaling, um, you know, people talk, talked about um, pharmaceutical companies. I used to work in the pharmaceutical industry. You look at um, artemisinin, which is the anti-malarial drug. You need about 200 to 300 tons a year. You compare that with the beta-lactam antibiotics, you know, the penicillins, the cephalosporins. You're talking about 50,000 tons a year. So that, that shows you the sort of scale that's needed. So, you know, the point that Jay made about setting up, you know, a small company that is focused on this is very important. The metabolic engineering aspect, you know, there's a lot of talk about metabolic engineering and synthetic biology now. Ten years ago, this was pretty new. It was, it, it was a stretch to make this work. So the, the initial work that you'll still see in a lot of the, the literature is making milligram quantities of, of uh, drugs, you know, small molecule drugs in, in microbes. We knew that we had to scale this up to tens of grams per liter. And this had never been done, done like this. So it made ideal sense to separate out from the basic work in Jay's lab and the, the development work and scale up, initial scale up uh, at a small company, Amaris. It was enormously useful to how the proof of concept worked out. Uh, for example, we initially thought we were going to produce in bacteria, in E. coli. And all the initial work at Amaris was in E. coli. But then, 18 months in, that had a lot of problems, and it became obvious that we weren't going to be able to scale up. But at the same time, uh, Jay had had people working on yeast. And so we were able to switch organisms, and we had an excellent head start, because a lot of the basic work had been done initially. And yeast turned out to be the production organism. So we were then able to, to um, eventually pass the org organism that we made, the yeast organism, over to a pharmaceutical company who did the actual scale up to industrial scale, you know, hundreds of tons per year. And last year, uh, Sanofi, we, we partnered with Sanofi, the French pharmaceutical company, and they were, they were able to scale up to, I think it's a third of the world's supply in 2014. So this made an ideal collaboration. And the fact that, that we had the ongoing relationship with Jay's lab uh, meant that you know, there, there were problems we hit continually, and we could discuss it you know, with experts in the field, in academia. So it was an ideal collaboration, I think. Well, you know, a lot, uh, a lot gets made of the differing um, the differences between academia and industry, particularly around the goals and the, uh, the incentives, the desire to publish, for example, uh, versus the need to uh, protect intellectual property, certainly the radically different timelines. You know, how, and starting with uh, you, uh, Chris and Jay, how did that, man did that manifest itself in your relationship, uh, and how was it uh, managed? Um, so we were fortunate that we had a, a sizable grant from the Gates Foundation to get this going. And, and so uh, in my lab, we built a big team. Uh, we actually moved off campus because uh, we didn't have enough space. Um, Amaris was immediately able to hire an a excellent team. Chris I, reminded me this morning, it was, he, he was the number six person, and that was after the three founders. Um, and so uh, we built a, a really excellent team there. And we had joint meetings because we were working on this as a team. My lab worked on it um, with Amherst for three years. And then I think they continued on beyond that for maybe another two to three years yeah. um, uh, doing uh, more of the optimization. So it, we pretty much worked as a team on this. The other thing that made this easy is um, when the university licensed this, they did it um, uh, royalty free, essentially, to Amherst, with the understanding that Amherst wouldn't make any money off this. So um, it, it also helped with the conflict of interest at the same time. Yeah. Um, I, don't think, I don't think there was any, any conflict in terms of publication. I mean, Jay's lab published. Some of us got our names on some of the papers when, when we helped out. But this was all fairly basic science. The actual scale-up work, 
at Amaris, we actually had to sit on the data for four or five years before we could publish. Uh, the fear was that if we published that we could make semi-synthetic artemisinin, that the farmers who plant um, Artemisia annua, which is where the, the, uh, the botanical drug comes from, the fear was they would stop planting. And if the production wasn't under, underway, there would actually be a shortage, which is the precise opposite of what we wanted to do. So I think in academia, you'd be hard put to sit on data for four or five years. Um, but we could do that in industry. What about, uh, what about you, uh, Jerry and Vu? And, and maybe you could even talk about, Jerry, as you alluded to, some uh, relationships that didn't go so well. <laughs> Got a lot of those. Um. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we've, um, Jerry's actually the, uh, the first of uh, four um, uh, collaboration that we've had with, uh, with academic collaborator that where we've licensed products from. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on my experience, there's really not a significant um, conflict of interest that we see. I mean, the, for example, if you talk about um, publication, I, I think that's largely overblown i think i think um industry uh values uh good science and and uh, if 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 uh, if you know what you're doing in terms of preparing uh, appropriate uh, patent filings and so on uh very rarely do i see uh, um, a reason not to allow the 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 academic collaborator to to publish uh, the, the the data I think where, where the conflicts of interest might, might arise is, uh, you know, a time when when um, the company requires a lot, uh, a lot of um, a lot of the academic in, in, uh, collaborators' time. Uh, that that could, you know, that could, um, 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 uh, you know, that could um, affect um, how 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 the company and and and, and the uh, investigator. Um, uh, allocate the appropriate time uh, since, since they are technically not working for the company and a lot of the university like like this university have a pretty rigid uh, um, requirement of how do you separate the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, professor's time with uh, you know with, with what he does for 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 the company yeah I, I agree I think We've seen little issue or problem over publication. Everybody likes to see good research published. And most, at least all the agreements I've had, have built into it a relatively time delineated uh, period wherein patents can be filed for newly discovered technology before they're published. And usually the time period is, is short enough that we're still passing papers back and forth and revising drafts by the time the patent attorneys get that done. So I not really encountered that as, as a major issue. Now the conflict of, ish, conflict of interest issues are very complicated and they, they're also very variable. Our institution uh, has pretty strict conflict of interest rules and it can be a real problem, particularly if you end up having equity in the company in terms of continuing research that's funded by the company. And I'd say that's been the biggest stumbling block. There's what's known as a 1B clause in the conflict of interest rules that basically say you can't receive any research funding or participate in any clinical research for a company in which you have equity. And that sets up a real dilemma since most of the time the company licensed the technology from you because you're the world's expert on it. You developed it, you've got the most technology. There are some ways that are allowed, for example, through SBBR and STTR type of applications or other government funded applications, but it really does raise some significant issues that have to be considered in terms of how you want to go forward. and. Um, since I have no equity in Eridus, it hasn't been a problem here, but I have a couple of other companies that I do, and, and it really can be problematic in terms of continuing the research, depending upon which path you choose as an investigator. What about you, Tom and Dan, and um, how, how have we been able to maintain that, uh, that rigid separation that, that we talked about? Yeah, I, I, I think maybe one um, aspect that um, may, may not be in entirely obvious is, um, you know, bringing up the different issues you did about uh, timelines, um, intellectual property, and publication. And so, you know, companies, for example, that might be interested in a particular technology, 
Um, you can segregate them, of course, among you know a startup biotech versus a well-established pharmaceutical company. In our own case, of course, we um, when we first started to work with the, the Portnoy Lab, this was from a company that we didn't have you know, a lot of money or anything else. And so it's not like that we come in with a billion dollars and then we're gonna buy something and then, you know, a year from now it's gonna be, you know, a, a, a drug in a vial that's used to treat people or to vaccinate against them. So just like, you know, uh, basic scientists have preliminary data, they get a grant, you know, R21 that can turn into an R01, et cetera. Startup biotech companies t typically have a little bit of seed funding that can be used to develop some technology and then based on success, begin to go through the development process ultimately that will uh, result in a phase one clinical trial. And as I said, uh, when we talked previously, um, right now we're in, a, in a, uh, a couple of different phase two clinical trials from a, that, uh, that uh, um, program that's in pancreatic cancer actually resulted from a phase one SBIR grant that was written in 2004 in collaboration with Dan and some investigators from Johns Hopkins and it was a you know a $300,000 grant and so it is you know sort of a very short and uh, stepwise process and another very important point just like small uh, startup biotech companies are trying to have success and attract additional rounds of funding, publication is very important to them as well. So I think it's an, an ideal partnership uh, results in not only the creation of intellectual property, which of course comes back to the university, and um, a lot of the way these licenses are structured based on success, meaning um, drugs or vaccines that ultimately are uh, for sale and approved by, you know, licensed by the FDA, those revenues um, come back to the university as well, and that's how these license agreements are structured. Yeah, I, I agree with the others that this issue of publication is probably overblown. I've never, we never had a problem with anyone holding up any papers. Maybe partially that's in, uh, attributed to the um, technology transfer office here has been very supportive of getting these uh, patents uh, written in a timely manner. So that, that hasn't been a problem as far as other conflict of interest. That took me some getting used to at first, um, and we have a conflict of interest committee that reviews us, and basically what I learned was to be totally transparent all the time. And so that means to disclose. Disclose in every paper what the relationship is, disclose in every talk, and our conflict of interest committee was even concerned about some of my students being, you know, who, being taken advantage of perhaps. And so they set up an ad hoc committee to interview individually all of my students every year just to make sure that there wasn't, um, that we weren't taking advantage of any of the students. And so the committee, everything seems to have worked. Yeah, we, we have a pretty similar situation. I have to send a letter around once a year yeah. to anybody who has to work on the technology, informing them of interest in that. But our conflict of interest committee is a little bit tougher. And I agree with you totally, Dan. Transparency is everything. I don't think anybody has any problem with transparency. It works. It allows for evaluation. It lets you know what's going on. It allows for an institution to send people in and verify. And what I worry about is when the rules become so onerous that it becomes tempting to not be transparent. And I don't know if we've encountered that, but sometimes they make it really, really difficult to um, progress in a logical manner uh, in terms of doing the research or in terms of expanding the technology or worrying about uh, what the source of funding is and how funds are commingled. But I think if we can really encourage a uh, highly transparent interaction between academic and uh, industry investigators, that that really will be optimal. So, Dan, you mentioned, you mentioned your students. I know we have a lot of graduate students, uh, postdocs here uh, in the audience. Um, maybe starting with, uh, with you and Tom, tell us a little bit about how students are uh, in your lab are involved in the research um, or, or 
communication with the company, and perhaps also reflect on um, the differences in their graduate and postgraduate careers that you see with uh, now that you're interacting with industry, perhaps more than when you were a graduate student in the lab that you did your PhD in. Well, it is true that when I did my PhD, almost nobody was going into industry. So it wasn't even an option. And now it seems about half of the individuals um, go into industry. Uh, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> How are students in your lab uh, uh, engaged or affected by the collaboration? In most of the initial interactions go through me and I often copy the student. And then we have scientific meetings either at either location, because we're, you're in Berkeley and I, we're in Berkeley. And it's, it seems it's not that different than academic um, relationships. Um, and in, in, a, in a number of cases, students and postdocs have been inventors on patents, and they seem to really enjoy that interaction. Um, and Do you see monetary return for that uh, name on those patents? A little. <laughs> these are not these pa these patents are being licensed at a relatively um, meager amount at this point, and, um, and so I, I'd have to ask them. But I, I think we're talking about you know in the you know I don't I don't really know how much if a thousand dollars or less perhaps. And that's just reflect because they're still reflected because they're earlier stage, um, you know, research programs. I mean, I think, you know, Michael, maybe one thing that could uh, maybe be relevant to this discussion, like for example, um, um, right now we have, I think, a very nice collaboration between um, Aduro and the Portnoy Lab, and it's really based on some technology that was developed um, at Aduro by Pete Lauer and Bill Hansen and Justin Scoble, where we can uh, selectively uh, delete in any gene um, on the bacterial chromosome, and you know that combined with the knowledge that you know once inside cells, listeria um, uh, can induce a particular gene expression profile, then we can selectively, um, in that setting, delete particular um, any any selected gene and ask how that affects pathogenesis. And so I think that's a really nice example how. Um, a, collab a very productive collaboration actually resulted in some tools that were developed for a completely different reason at the company that are then uh, very rel relevant to um, just asking basic science questions about the organism itself. And there's been a number of times in our collaboration where those sorts of instances you know, have occurred. Jay, what about you? I mean, it's high profile uh, collaboration and a high profile lab, and, and how has that impacted what students get to do and what they expect to do when they want to join your group? Yeah, so um, uh, I think it's a really, it really enriches the environment for the students. They get this interaction with the company as they see another side um, to research. Um, they're very much, uh, all the collaborations that I've had with companies are very much about the science. Uh, the students don't, um, for the most part, I haven't had to worry about the students and conflict of interest, but uh, like they said, uh, we do disclose everything early and often um, in all of our publications and all of my talks. Um, and I make sure that the students know if I happen to be a founder of one of the companies that we're interacting with. Um, but for the most part, uh, I think it's been a very rich experience for the students. Sure, what about you? No, I to totally oh, agree. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> from, from the industrial side, let me just agree with Jay. You know, we like working with students, um, students and postdocs. Uh, I think they gain from it, and we gain from their, their view of it, too. And you hire some of them, then. And we the hire end. some of them. Well, in my lab, we start the day with the students by going down to the dungeon to retrieve them. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> bring them up to the lab. Um, no, actually, um, w one of the things that's actually happened recently is that most of my students are now going into industry or patent law or you know, in a tr uh, tech transfer offices and things like that. So given how difficult it is to sell a career in academic research these days, with just the circumstances we're confronted with, I think the opportunity to work in industry, learning from developing technology of which they're on a patent or something like that, has really 
at least made them aware of these other opportunities that you can use with a PhD that you can go to. And, you know, I guess you got to do what you like to do, but it's a little disappointing at one level, but I understand it totally that it, there's not as much of an interest in going into a sort of a traditional academic research setting when you have these other options available. Pooh, how has it uh, impacted, uh, you know, even the, the, the workforce, the folks that you see applying for jobs that are coming out of, uh, yeah, out of know, academic labs? Yeah, uh, you know, the collaboration chair, we, we, I, I didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to host any of his students at postdoc, but in, in two other collaborations I have uh, where uh, the students actually do, did rotations in, in, in our lab. And uh, uh, I, like the other uh, panel uh, panelists here, I, I, what, what I got the, the sense is that... Uh, the students found it to be very enriching uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, the, certainly, the, the work focuses can be very different from, from what he or she is used to in, in, the, in their PI's lab. In industry, of course, we, we emphasize uh, more on the translational side of, of, uh, of, of, of the drug uh, candidate. Uh, you know, the students get a chance to be exposed to um, a research method that, that uh, they would not have otherwise been exposed to. So, for example, how they engineer a cell line to, to, to improve productivity. I mean, there's a lot of science behind that, that oftentimes the, the PI themselves don't, don't appreciate how to do the scale up, how to conduct advanced uh, pharmaceutical formulation research to get the drug to do things that, uh, that, uh, that some of you may not imagine that, that, that we can get them to do. For example, we can take uh, some of the viruses that the panelists uh, uh, present today and stabilize it at room temperature and be able to put it on doses presentation that uh, that's, can be as simple as a thin film where you place on a, the, 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 the vaccine's tongue and, and the, the the vaccine experience completed. So those are the sort of, 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 of uh, technology type of, of experiment that they, they get exposed to. Number two, they, they, they get to appreciate that in industry, we actually emphasize a lot more on the robustness of, of, of demonstration of how the technology works. The assays themselves need to be very robust and highly reproducible. So, so they come away with appreciating uh, the, the other angle, and that is how to really, uh, really uh, show that, uh, that, that, that a certain uh, set of experiment work, how to plan their experiment more efficiently and, 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 and effectively so that by the time they go back and, and, uh, and continue their thesis research or undergraduate student would go on to graduate school, what we find is that uh, those students tend to be more, uh, uh, more productive uh, as they conduct their, 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 their thesis research because they, they, they know how to uh, spend, uh, uh, you know, have um, more effective use of their time. They get to do uh, uh, um, uh, um, the, the thesis work more effectively. And this is the feedback that I'm getting from, from friends of mine who are, who, who are, are, are the advisor. And so I think for, for a number of reasons, uh, there, there's, there's a great benefit. Uh, and I would highly encourage uh, some of you faculty member that have students that uh, uh, to uh, to try to have uh, give their ex uh, them some experience in in an in a industry setting in terms of research. So maybe before we open the the floor to questions, I'd, I'd ask one more thing about um, you know what is it, and this is a little bit of a newlywed game question, kind of what is it that you what what is it uh, that you want in your partner? What is it that you look for in a partner? From the academics to the industry side, from the industry to the academic side, I mean, there must have been, and particularly in that main scientist, that main person you have to work with uh, day to day, very much like, uh, uh, you know, Jay and Chris and, 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 and Tom and Dan. What makes that relationship click? Chris, Jay? We, we, we want a partner who wants to succeed. You know, we have an end goal, or we had an end goal, you know, make this drug. Uh, and, and we had to succeed, you know, kids are dying of malaria. And, you know, in Jay, we had the perfect partner. We were, we were absolutely driven to, to, to make this happen. You know, the collaboration between the academia and the industry worked out perfectly. So it has to be driven to an end goal, not just discovering the basic science, which is very, very important, but driven towards the end goal, that that is hugely important. And I'd say as an academic, um, I, so I agree with everything you said. Um, in general, in, in co uh, company partners, I, I appreciate those that um, appreciate the science we're doing, 
um, that uh, will give the students uh, the ability to um, get through some of the experiments and, and uh, won't push them so hard. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, I know companies have deadlines and they have to get things out uh, very quickly and that isn't always compatible with an academic schedule. Um, and uh, uh, just uh, that appreciation for uh, that students have to take classes, that uh, we have to publish papers, I think that's really important. And, and we had that with Amherst uh, very much so. Yeah, I think one of the key elements which really does apply to all these things is trust. And one of the things that we were able to do with Eridus and Vu's group is transfer assays and technology from our lab to their setting, and they worked. Not, it wasn't the smoothest thing in the world, but they never are, but eventually they worked. And I think that gave a sense of trust on their side that what we had been doing and were publishing was accurate and was robust and could be scaled up. And when I saw that they could replicate our results, I knew my technology was in good hands. So I think that's another element. Yeah, uh, if I can add to uh, some of the uh, some of the other parent, uh, factors, I think I think it's it, it, it's great to have uh, the inventor, the the academic collaborator, to really want to stay engaged, as 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 uh, we the company take the technology further into development and trying to translate that into actual product. Because along the way, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're going to need to understand a little more about the science. When things go wrong, you need to go back to the investigator and be able to discuss and, and get their feedback as to uh, what may, may have gone wrong and, and how do we, how do we uh, you know, correct the course. Uh, also, um, uh, what would be the uh, possible eventual use of this? What sort of therapeutic indication that would make sense and so on as we move uh, uh, closer into clinical development? So I think having the, uh, uh, the academic collaborators stay engaged as, as, uh, as uh, um, the, the, the project proceeds to further uh, preclinical development, I think is very cr uh, uh, crucial. But also because you know, these things take time. You know, translating you know, a, a very early uh, research project into, into Therapeutic candidate takes a lot of time, a lot of failures, and so uh, they need to be, they need to be patient and 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 and, and stay engaged. And in, in our case, obviously, uh, Jerry was was uh, extremely supportive, and, and so that that aspect was, uh, was 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 very nice. The other thing I might want to add is I think it's also nice if the academic investigators also here are herself uh, are entrepreneurial, because why? Because <clears throat> there are a lot of other facets to uh, moving the project through uh, commercialization that, uh, that if they're entrepreneur entrepreneurial, they'll work with you. So for example, in terms of the patenting process, the patent prosecution lifespan of a technology like a monoclonal antibody can take five to seven years. And so along the way, you're gonna have to do a lot of fights with the examiner and so on. And you're gonna need them to, to help you craft and modify and optimize the, the claim sets and so on so that the technology actually get, uh, gets, uh, gets patent um, uh, um, uh, prosecution uh, conducted with, uh, with, with, with good success. So, so so there are a number of, uh, number of reasons, you know, I think, staying engaged and having the investigator uh, appreciate the entrepreneurial side of, of, of how a project move along. I think that's, that's very helpful. I think the main thing that is key to the relationship is that we both love science, love the science. And I think our most, most exciting interactions are about the basic science. Trust, of course, is important as, as, as well. And also, I think we've given each other the respect that if one of us emails, the other one will respond, mostly. <laughs> and, um, and then I all have our challenges. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's been, and, keep, and also being thoughtful, you know, if we have something that I think we should, we should discuss and vice versa, we just think of the, we are the person. And I should say this relationship, is, in my case at least, has uh, gone a lot longer than either of my marriages, so. <laughs> <laughs> I won't make any comments on your, on, a, a yeah, <laughs> on your personal life, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, that, it's, it's, I think something that's actually um, very important, I think it's you know, indisputable that, that the, and I think just looking, for example, at the more recently approved drugs, right? Good, good, good basic science ultimately is going to drive new and effective uh, drugs. But the other important thing I don't think that is um, 
quite apparent. It's not really a question of, of working with an academic investigator and doing just one thing and that turns into to one drug. And one reason that we like uh, this collaboration is because since our company now is um, through its various iterations now more than 10 years old, um, we have what we'll call a pipeline. And that's, um, I think, based on a number of different collaborations. And for example, now, um, where I don't think it has a lot to do with Listeria without going into the science, but this initial basic collaboration uh, has led into our you know, very strong interest in the sting pathway and developing uh, you know, novel small molecules that activate this pathway and led to a you know, collaboration and consultation with the, the Vance Laboratory. And so I think you know, the optimal um, ideal uh, collaboration can really form the basis of a, a, a successful um, biotech company, and that's that's something that can only happen if you have a good academic collaboration. I should also want this, we should have mentioned that this conference mm -hmm. is we're being supported to some extent um, mm -hmm. with a donation from a Duro, and that uh, <laughs> CEO <Transparency>. Steve, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Steve Isaacs as well is uh, very supportive of Send and, the, yeah. and global health and how this, some of this research could have um, impact in the developing world as well. So that's just something of relevance to this actual symposium. So we have time for uh, one or two questions uh, from the audience. Uh, are there uh, any folks who have questions for our panelists? Uh, in the back there, Kim. Hi. Um, so for the graduate students and postdocs in the audience um, from both sides, the academic and the industry side, what are some specific things we can do to either if we're going into academics, prepare ourselves to try and facilitate these interactions with companies? And alternatively, if we're interested in industry, what are the kind of things we can do to also facilitate it the other way? And then want a volunteer? <laughs> uh, sure. So uh, it, I, it, initially, it, it often takes the, the PI to set up the uh, interaction with a company because you have to make sure that it's going to work out and there are a lot of issues around that. But once it gets set up, um, then I think uh, just being very proactive about it, um, trying to interact with company scientists as much as possible because they want to see the good science as well. And so uh, generally it can be a very rich relationship. I try to set it up so that I'm not in the way of the students communicating directly with the company. Um, because I think that gets them uh, the interactions that they want and need. I, I should mention that there are a number of training programs that require internships in companies for a period of time. And I, as a faculty member, often we are um, reluctant to see our graduate students go off or postdocs go off and do an internship when they're doing all this great science in, in our laboratories. But I think it can be a very enriching experience. And I've grown up a little bit um, and realized how good it is for the students and, and encourage it whenever I can. Yeah, let, let me a second that. I, internships are great. Yeah. If you can, if you want to go into industry, try and get an internship first. You'll see whether you like it. The company that you're working with will get a feel, feel for you. And it, it's generally a very positive experience. So in this first file environment, as far as uh, patents, do you guys find yourself that you have to uh, have your students, the ones that are collaborating between industry and, and the academia, uh, having to fill out non-disclosure agreements? Because uh, obviously, there's all this communication going by and you know if you disclose something in public now you're not allowed I mean this is the intricacies that are not really discussed in this whole lovely marriage you know it's in, it's in the needy arguments that happen later on so you know any comments on that um, I don't have my students sign non-disclosure agreements and I actually don't know if the university will even allow it but I try to make sure that the um, companies are not telling us too much of their confidential information. In fact, I'd rather, know, I'd rather not know it, right? Because it, it, it creates a lot of issues when you have to protect against that and you have to tell people not to disclose things. Um, whenever we write a paper, um, we've usually disclosed it first to the Office of Technology Licensing and uh, so that they have a chance to file a patent. But the companies also get to review it to make sure that there isn't confidential information in it because we don't want to let things out from the companies. At the same time, if we can operate without knowing so much of that, um, then it just allows us 
a little easier flow of information. Yeah, all, all our uh, agreements with companies have a pretty standard clause and anything that is confidential has to be labeled that way and provided that way. So it's not too difficult to tell people if they're sitting in on a seminar or a meeting, if they see that type of information, that it really can't be disclosed. Of course, they put the onus of enforcement on the PI, and I'm not sure what I would do if somebody violated it. Fortunately, I've never had to deal with it. Um, but I don't think it really comes up as a big issue. I think for almost all of us, the patent issues are dealt with and the IP file before uh, there's much public disclosure. I mean, I've, I've held back abstracts, for example, for meetings while waiting for IP to be filed. I will say that. What about um, uh, Tom, Boo, or Chris? Do you see graduate students, postdocs, and that academic lab as you know, leaky with respect to confidential information and, and make sure that it uh, uh, is held back? I mean, I, you know, we have real life examples of, of uh, interns. I mean, what I, oh, there's a person here uh, uh, um, that now is actually an employee of Aduro. Her, her name's Kelsey Godier, who just recently um, we hired from the uh, Barton Lab. Uh, she was an intern many years ago that when we were interested in the, um, in, um, the relationship between different Listeria mutants and induction of interferon that ultimately has led us to our interest in the sting pathway. Um, but when she was as an uh, intern, there wasn't any confidentiality. She was doing very basic research in collaboration with the Portnoy Lab. Um, so there are, and I think this has already been addressed, real barriers if there are confidential meetings. Interns don't participate in those anyway. And those, frankly, are always um, related much later to you know, development and uh, things that are already in the clinic and much further downstream. So I don't, it's not really fundamental barriers. Great, well, well thank you all. Uh, many happy returns as you uh, progress. <laughs>